Thank you very much. I'm thinking about changing the keynote to why we should go back to paper records, but uh, let's, uh, let's get on with it anyway. I'm, I, went to the, I want to thank the signal for inviting me to contribute to the opening of this year's conference. It's a great honor to help support the overall theme of the week. And I have the privilege the opportunity to make some initial comments for the proceedings, which I hope are helpful. Um, I wanted to start by giving you some historical context about me. Um, my first degree was in law back in the day when I was choosing my degree subject. Like many students, um, I had it difficult that I didn't really know what I wanted to study. A teacher of mine suggested that perhaps I should read law. Law was considered a general, solid degree with prospects. This was at the end of the 1980s when universities were approaching the end of a regressive period in which many of the disciplines including the social sciences, were teaching curriculums using a very different worldview, and therefore a very different approach to education. This was just before universities became more commercially driven and disciplines started to be more narrowly defined. The progressive approach recognises changes in the way that new knowledge was being produced in response to a more complex and interconnected world. Disciplines realised they could not address increasing, increasingly complex questions or existing Cartesian methods, splitting things and processes down to the most reducible parts, because the whole was more than the parts. The specialization was missing the big picture, and that homogenization meant losing valuable knowledge. Instead, new knowledge processes start to be seen as naturally transdisciplinary, and they address dynamic processes, not static things, and they try to take account of change and transformation. They were more historically driven, much of the heritage sector has not really been part of this fundamental change in approach, despite many academics in museum studies breeding with museums to understand and adopt different perspectives and to communicate the complexity. That was that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so. Oh, I've gone on to the next one. Much so, I'll start that again. Much of the heritage sector is not really part of this fundamental change in approach, despite many academics and museum studies pleading with museums to understand and adopt different perspectives and to communicate the complexity of social and historical connections, their collections, and beyond. Museums are not really part of this new movement from the static to the dynamic and from the disciplinary or subdisciplinary to the transdisciplinary, from the intrinsic to the relational, at least in part. A conference was even held and a book produced called The Two Art Histories, comparing the approaches of social history oriented academics and that of materially oriented curators. So I'm going to go to that. Oh. Lecturers running the course that I was on felt it to be a good year Learning the statutes and case law and how to navigate the courts was not enough. Students need to understand how they were related to society as a whole. The degree was called Law in Context. In family law, it was not enough to know the legal technicalities of divorce, and it was important to understand the history of property rights for women, the causes and impact of domestic violence, and the effect on the law on children and changing attitudes towards the constituted family. It was not enough to be able to technically advise someone arrested at a police station. You needed to understand the bias in the system, the motivations behind the laws, like stop and search and the implications generally of new criminal laws and for human rights and civil liberties. Oops. He needs to understand the history of penal practices and their effect on prisoners. It was not enough to memorize judges' decisions. He needs to understand the culture from which judges are in, um, originated, and which guided their decisions and you needed to understand the philosophical underpinnings guiding judges' approaches. By putting law in context and understanding how laws change in relation to society, we could better understand how understand the processes of law. One thing was certain. Static laws eventually produce bad laws. In documentation, we've reached a point where simply providing references, binding aids, catalog indexes, simply doesn't address the new challenges and, uh, and, the, and answer the questions being asked of us. And they don't address the challenges of communicating and interacting with larger, more diverse communities in modern information infrastructures. 
the world and society has changed, but some of the fundamental rules and rules which govern museum documentation have remained relatively static, and static documentation at some stage produces bad documentation. It also reflects lack of direction in terms of the social role of museums, particularly in a global digital knowledge society. A famous 20th century British cons uh, business consultant, Peter Drucker, who coined the phrase knowledge worker and advised businesses on transitioning um, to what was once called a knowledge society, a term that's rarely used today, said that knowledge has to be improved, challenged, and increased constantly when it vanishes. Anthony Griffiths, a former keeper of prints and drawings at the British Museum, and who spent the museum's collection online system, a project that I managed, said that a system constructed for inventory purposes was absurdly limiting and dangerous. He talks about keeping records in line with the latest scholarly information. A progression also means expanding the categories of knowledge to reflect social needs. Addressing the needs of wider audiences means clear and explicit meaning. Addressing significance and relevance and accepting contributions from external communities. He also commented, like Drucker, that information worked out of the door the day that any curator retired and his or her successor had to start all over again. Now documentation needs to be continually changing documentation and it needs to be constantly contextualizing and interconnecting to answer bigger questions. The subject of this talk is documentation and social responsibility. The theme of the conference is documentation, knowledge and linked data. All these aspects are interconnected and point to this new approach to documentation and in particular, the sophisticated structured forms of digital documentation. If we are going to use linked data as a medium for documentation, then we need to understand how it communicates with people and supports knowledge generation. Structured information has become a crucial part of digital information infrastructures and all museums, large and small, have become global communicators. But the internal processes of museums have not a role to address this type of global communication on the web of data. Our public data publication processes are just that, publications of existing forms of data based on information systems and standards that reflect a data administration approach that doesn't address the wider categories of knowledge necessary to fulfill new educational needs and address social responsibilities. It's become clear that we've built up a legacy of documentation records that are anachronistic, lacking adequate context, and which embed racist, sexist, and generally discriminative narratives, both implicitly and explicitly. New technology does not by itself change this, and I don't say this lightly and I'll produce examples during this talk. Language is one issue, but others include a lack of attention to historical and social research, which should be used in factualization, correcting or remedying omissions. The lack of new and important categories of knowledge going beyond the traditional intrinsic museum record is highly problematic both internally because it inhibits the progression and back office processes, which themselves become anachronistic, and externally, in the strength of our relationships with communities interested not simply in objects in themselves, but with the knowledge that surrounds objects, a semantic network of information. Documentation should be a continual process, and there should be little difference between practice, knowledge processes, and what we call research. The fundamental role of, muse of the museum in assembly objects and maintaining them with a specific intellectual environment emphasizes that museums are storehouses of knowledge as well as storehouses of objects. The objective of this talk depends on the extent to which we understand the potential value of documentation as a social asset, a prioritization in dealing with diversity and inclusion, and a commitment to the removal of institutionalized discrimination linked in by previous documentation methods, technologies, standards, and management practices. As already Bradbury alludes, we are now regularly pumping our data to the web, which is lacking in real substance and integrity. Cram them full of non-combustible data, chop them so damn full of facts they'll build stuff, so absolutely brilliant with information, they'll build their thinking, they'll get a sense of motion without moving, and they'll be happy because facts of that sort don't change. Don't give them any slippery stuff like philosophy or sociology to tie things up with. That way lies melancholy. I will argue, for example, that only semantic knowledge systems moving away from databases can provide a progressive documentation strategy because traditional databases lack the necessary semantics and the ability to accommodate transdisciplinary interconnections or adequately represent historical change and should be phased out as part of our new definition of documentation. 
There have been many promises by technologists to resolve the issue of documentation with new forms of database technology, but this is a loser. As a historian, Eric Hobsbawm said, one of the big issues addressing history with technology is an ahistorical, engineering, problem-solving approach by means of mechanical models and devices. We need to pay far more attention to content rather than simply replicating legacy data in new technical structures. The generation of knowledge is not achieved by a computer and a technology like named data, which is simply a technical structure, but by humans. The question is our technology augments our intellectual processes. Structured documentation should provide a meaningful, evidence-based content communicated in a way to allow humans to generate and contribute new knowledge. What does social responsibility for museum documentation look like in the digital world? Given that our data is being openly published and potentially re re reused, if the data has any value uh, by many different communities, we have to have high standards of accuracy. This means that we must constantly review our documentation. We need to provide adequate context so the underlying narratives are not distorted or hidden. To avoid this partial narrative, we need to stop limiting the, the categories of information we're allowed to use. And, we, and which are not currently part of administrative documentation standards. We need to represent the historical significance and current relevance of items we curate. We need to directly challenge information that contains errors, prejudice, and bias. This type of documentation requires a greater degree of complexity, but not a complexity that we need to be afraid of, but that we need to embrace to overcome the intellectual overhead of reusing reductive data, which ultimately means fragmentation duplication and ineffectiveness without sufficient practical benefits. Unless we embrace the authorship of detailed and changing patterns of structured information, we'll not be able to contribute to the history of society as a whole. If we do not prioritize and rethink documentation, the risk is not just that objects go missing, which in itself is a serious matter, but we lose the knowledge that makes those object objects significant, significant in the first place. A general lack of priority in documentation is a serious cause for concern for a whole variety of reasons that go far beyond the museum inventory. Museum documentation has been greatly influenced by library cataloging. Early examples of library catalogues include the Sumerian Archive in the city-state of Europe around 3400 BCE, the cuneiform tablets that were recorded in the Royal Library of Ashburnipal, in the 17th, uh, 7th century BC, and the Alexandrian Library in the 2nd and 3rd century BC. Gradually, the documentation of objects started to run in parallel with bibliographic lives, establishing at least an administrative connection between objects and associated textual works. The was recorded was still effectively a type of index that we use today using vocabularies for categorization. It's worth noting that despite the fact that we have developed extreme Specializations that fragmented museum and library expertise and information. Many organizations now attempt to reverse this trend and in part mend this uh, situation. The precursor to the museum was the medieval Wunderkammer, which had no catalogue or index. It was viewed as a microcosm designed to evoke knowledge about the world. In this unordered environment filled with objects, the visitor was able to construct their own semantic networks and contemplate the interconnections and dependencies that was between the natural and the artificial. Visitors, unconstrained by object labels, could arrange these objects in a way that was meaningful to them. The Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben said that only seemingly does chaos reign in the Wunderkammer. However, to the mind of the medieval scholar, it was a sort of microcosm that reproduced in its harmonious confusion the animal, vegetable, and mineral macrocosm. This is why individual objects seem to find their meaning only side by side with others, between the walls of a room in which the scholar could measure every moment the boundaries of the universe. In the digital world, the Vodokama is far broader and far more complex. From the 17th century, many countries, in many countries, the commonplace book became a means for people to keep a record of knowledge they had accumulated from books and experiences. They were perhaps an early form of database, a personal record, but with more flexibility and no fixed data model. It wouldn't be long before someone tried to filmize the common base book with technology. Thomas Harrison's Ark of Studies allowed these snippets of information to be organized in a cabinet full of paper hooks 
and a subject index which allowed cross-references. Scientists like Gottfried Leibniz considered a philosophical horse between that behind modern computer science and wanted to use this invention to organize information and collaborate with colleagues. But the vision was far bigger than the clunky technology could handle. Harrison's vision was to compile all the special and distinct notions existing in old books. Someone commented that even though this is a task on a colossal scale, he thinks it need not be despaired of since any number of people, 10 or 20,000 say, can be involved in collecting the material. It was a task, as Hartlib said, for the whole human race. This vision was, uh, was that building knowledge was collaborative and a participatory activity. If only we could combine our shared resources, we could create and maintain something like Harrison's vision. But despite the internet and the World Wide Web and our powerful computer technology, we seem as far away from Harrison's vision. In fact, we seem to be going in the opposite direction. The web has become a perfect example of fragmentation hiding in plain sight. More and more people, including the web's crea creator, Tim Berners-Lee, see a dysfunctional environment which works against knowledge building and which we accept and conform to. This may be in some way, as James Bible says, because of computational thinking, the product of oversimplification, bad data and deliberate obfuscation, which allows us to recognize the ways in which it fails and reveals its own limitations. Charles Babbage, rated, credited with as being the inventor, at least in design, of the computer, had no grand plan for world knowledge. It was a machine that could take over the work of humans and reduce the cost of training and employing them. It set in motion, he set in motion intellectual machines to break the artisan's gills, using the combined principles of Cartesian scientific reductionism and Adam Smith's equally reductive division of labor as inspiration. His vision of the machine or computer was an, of an object of control, the precursor to Taylorism and scientific management, the tool of modern capitalism that impeded the knowledge and judgment of workers. Its tradition continues in the digital world as digital tailorism, represented by a growing, hidden, low-paid workforce, filling in the gaps left by machines, just as those created by the batteries that Babbage tried to automate. However, as a new optimistic modernist vision appeared in the 20th century, the vision of Thomas Harrison's arc of studies was taken up once again by Paul Rotlett, who laid the foundations of modern information science. He and others like him thought that the communication of knowledge would help promote peace and collaboration across the world. He created the universal decimal classification system, a hugely sophisticated subject indexing system, which makes today's subject categories look black and lightless. At one stage, it had over 200 basic classifications, which could be semantically connected, allowing transdisciplinary cataloging. His mundanium and information city would facilitate peace and common understanding. Elliot believed that books carried the history of all books that came before them. They overlapped with one another, repeating and amplifying, but at the same time, expanding and changing knowledge over time. Science was historically driven. Books represented an evolution of knowledge. Or it was said that books conserve mental energy. What is contained in books passes to other books when they themselves have been destroyed. A normal bibliological creation, no matter how original, how powerful, implies redistribution, combination, and new amalgamations from what is previously given. Books contain an evolving dynamic, building a provenance of knowledge. He created a new technology, the microfish system, a temporary mechanism that he anticipated that people would eventually access a mundane from devices with screens in their own homes. Today, the classification is still used in organizations interested in detailed information exchange across national borders and languages. However, regardless of the sophistication of its index, it is still ultimately an index, unable to represent the social, economic, and political context in which these subjects existed. It was still mundane. In archiving, the concept of conceptual reference means not only a physical arrangement, but their collections are organized using an intellectual arrangement, which is derived from an understanding of the historical context in which things or processes are created, used, and connected. And those intellectual arrangements will change over time as new knowledge is discovered. Going back to the computer, the database was invented in, 19, in the 1960s by Charles Backman. It was then called the Integrated Data Store. 
he wasn't an academic, but part of a new generation of computer engineers working in commercial data processing departments. His motivation was not even close to that of Harrison and Otler. He just wanted to make computers more accessible and efficient for processing supply chain information. The process of taking real materials, creating finished products, and distributing them to customers. There was no need to think about wider context. This just got in the way of bulk processing, storage, and retrieval. What IT people call scale. Even today, when a system is appraised, the question is still, does it physically scale? But never does it intellectually scale. By bringing together different data tools into a data management system, he made computer systems affordable to new, more com companies who could not afford to create their own custom systems. It was the beginning of a growing demand for the shelf products, which took a function and created an intrinsic model aimed once again at reducing cost of ownership to the owner of the capital. It wasn't designed for users. The database system that Batman created is more or less the same as the databases we use today. They have no semantics, which impedes their communication and interoperability beyond the walls of the owning organization. You can't easily change their data models to accommodate new creative thinking, forcing you to arrange your thinking elsewhere and to necessarily fragment information. It does not allow the information to be arranged in different patterns and relationships for different questions and creates a production line which inhibits thinking. The gap between documentation and new approaches to knowledge production has been getting wider and wider. In the disciplines of history, historians investigate in wider and wider sources, making connections that are rarely represented in digital information systems. But we should be far more aware of how scholars now work and to capture more of the information they produce. Scholars investigate questions for long periods of time, collecting vast and varied information. They then create different patterns, the empirical facts they've created support, to support interpretation. And finally, these interpretations are converted into textual narratives. You know, the patterns and relations of facts are lost, but they really should be documented. These investigations involve abstractions from the real world and from real world sources. And there's a direct connection between those sources and the abstractions and notes that they make. When they are asked to abstract their abstractions into a database, they not only have to conform to a fixed model, but the real world connection to the sources is compromised. This is known as a theory of instrumentation. It therefore doesn't support the skills and knowledge of people working in documentation. Database systems are designed so that they can naturally can only deal with one function. Their lack of formal semantics limits the complexity of the data they can practically manage. Language structure is the basis for accurate orientation in the world, so long, so long as it displays relevance with respect to the structure of the fragment of reality to which it refers. Establishing this relevance is not possible in any other way than through empirical findings. Without them, the meaning of the linguistic structure and the actions based upon it become irrational and inadequate. Ultimately, reality coerces adjustment, although this is done at great expense on a trial by error basis, which is always connected with a high risk of failures, which cannot be undone. A map is not the territory, words are not the things they represent. The technical explanations of how digital communication is conducted is based on Shannon's theory of communication which is purely focused on whether a message can be transmitted and remain intact when it is received at the other end of the communication. This theory is liberally explained in digital humanities courses, but in no way does it explain how meaning is generated in the receiver. This has been called the information paradox. The answer is that knowledge is generated by the receiver using the references they know, like an Agamben's Wunderkammer. But in the complex modern world of digital data communications, we need to provide more meaningful reference. Eating yeah. Martin Dürer, knowledge is a particular relation you can relate to its reference and you can justify. No machine can recognize a referent. Therefore, only humans can know. All scientific and historical knowledge is based on evidence. Encoded knowledge is information. Processed information becomes new knowledge in the recipient if the relation to the reference is preserved and the justification and, and the justification back to the original evidence is transparent. This is a strong aspect of CDOC CRM. 
one of the reasons its use continues to grow. It is a dialectic necessity, a logical solution to the contradiction of information without knowledge. It meets the demands of a new documentation. No computer system will be perfect, free from constraints. But we can do much more by adopting cemented relational systems of documentation and empirical benchmark and empirically benchmark our language, and which can better represent our sources or evidence. Linked data is a broad term, but precisely it is just a technical meta model, a structure for carrying data, albeit through the web of data. Linked data provides a vehicle for semantic networks, but it's the content, it's the content that we must ultimately be concerned with. If structure rules over content, then we can well. It shocks. The reading machine, the Nurata Jets, my book, the Hatmember. Okay. I don't have to, I seems long time. Hello? But if structure brings over content, then we can. It's gone. Structure won't be on the question of the whole world. Hello, 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 hello. Bestie, bestie. We don't map on one more. Oh, means then more. Down. If structure rules over content, then we cannot create digitally aware documentation. In databases, it's the structure that rules. It is the technical instrumentation that rules. And I say again that you should be contemplating the removal of databases and using systems that are about community knowledge build. There is little benefit in transferring, like the line, legacy data from databases to linked data. It must be conducted with a view to expanding the categories of knowledge and linking data should ultimately be about authoring and supporting a dialogue that builds knowledge and expertise. Linked data becomes useful when it's coupled with a framework that supports meaningful content. And this is what the CDOC CRM provides. The creation and development of the CDOC CRM is by far the most significant innovation in museum and wider documentation. It should never be compared, put in the same box as traditional standards that evolve out of database and data processing mindsets. It's been developed to address many of the challenges that I've mentioned. It does what no computer scientist has come close to doing, describing historically based knowledge domains in a way that is semantically and universally accurate, but also allowing us to go far beyond our specializations and to be transistors. It promotes the dynamic improvement of the information. It supports a diversity of knowledge and its manipulation according to our thinking. Digital thinking about the world becomes efficient. The focus should now be to help people to transfer to this new way of working. I said that I would illustrate my statement about anachronistic and discriminatory information, which itself provides empirical evidence supporting the argument that we need to change our view of documentation. And I've chosen a couple of some examples to get through both of them. Um, but I haven't chosen them out of thin air. So the methodology, can't really see it very clearly, um, the methodology is to take a 17th century catalogue and choose examples that have sufficient information to allow me to compare them to current documentation. I went asked to go through the research that I undertook to prepare these case studies to try and support my claims. I put before you an early catalogue of Don Saltaro's coffee shop, whose original proprietor was James Salter. The catalogue, often vague, provides an important marker for understanding the extent to which our processes change over time as part of our understanding how society changes over time. While the technical processes and structure might have changed, the content may not have. James Salter had been a servant of Hans collection formed the basis of the British Museum collection. Sloan provided Salter, along with others, objects he could display in the coffee shop. 
to entertain and provide focus for discussions about the world. This is the first time. This is the first item that I'm going to go through. It's an amulet or charm given by the fetishes or priests in Guinea to the credulous natives. Each division contains some Arabic characters. These poor, deluded wretches believe that once they're suspended around their neck or otherwise carried about them, they'll be safe from thunder, slavery, or other casualties that the priests chose to say they'll be preserved from. This viewpoint, typical of the time, seeks to net, denigrate a West African religion an associated religious object similar to the ones that are used in many parts of the world, including the West. There are examples of these objects in many museums, and they can be identify, identified through generative AI systems like ChatGBT. Despite the nature of Soltero's description, I can take the context and wording it provides, and without mentioning an object type from a vocabulary, I can ask the following question. What item was worn around the neck by people in Guinea, West Africa, in the 18th century to bring good luck and provide protection, including protection from slavery and contained Arabic text? I'm using context such as period, place, event, concept, position, or semantic types, processes covered by the CDOC CRM. The chat GPT identifies this information, speeds it up, and returns with the answer that it is a Gregory. It adds some additional information that the scripture it contains is from the Quran and states that they are an integral part of the spiritual and cultural practices in West Africa. They provided a source of psychological and power for those who carried them in the face of such challenging circumstances. We now have an object type, a green green. And if we look this up in a popular online encyclopedia, we find that this object is also described as a voodoo object. This is an object associated with West African religion, brought over to the Americas by the slaves, where it remains a significant religious object. For example, it's worn by the slaves in the Haitian Revolution, an insurrection against their French colonial oppressors. Going back to chat GBT, you can ask what events in history are relevant to the Greek Greek. We get the answer. And these protective amulets were worn by slaves during their journey across the Atlantic. They were used, as we said, in the Haitian Revolution, but also in many other Caribbean revolts. And they were used as symbols as res of resistance. They were also worn during the American Civil Rights Movement. In fact, the correct spelling of the West African religion is, in fact, Vodou. The word Vodou, as scholars have investigated, is a Western world that is used to promote a negative image and is now used interchangeably without distinction. But it's become ingrained in our culture. If we go back to ChatGBT and ask the question, is Vodou a Western construct? We have to be careful. Our meaning is not clear, not explicit. The question is interpreted in terms of the religion not the spelling. It simply says that Voodoo is a valid religion originating from Africa and associates it with other spellings called, including Voodoo. If we ask a more, a more precise question, the word Voodoo in Western, is, is the word Voodoo a Western construct? Then this is now understood in the right context as a Western world, but at most just a simplification or a variation of the original Voodoo. If we then ask the, uh, whether the word voodoo is racist, the answer is not inherently, but it is associated with portrayals of African mass and African diaspora religions and their practitioners. In some cases, the term has been associated with harmful and offensive stereotypes in popular culture and media. However, we know that it's been a large amount of material that tends to associate black communities with criminality and activities to, designed to generate fear. In this piece on JSTOR Daily, it states that since slavery, tales of voodoo helped establish black criminality as a social fact and ultimately reconstruction era public voodoo narratives helped cultivate the ground for and served at least as a key forerunners to the public narratives of the black beast rapist, which uh, defended so southern political violence for generations, black and disenfranchisement and legal segregation. Louisiana. If we go to another source, like the African version of Microsoft Encarta, it explains that Vodou includes spellings such as Vodun and Vodun, derived from a word for God and spirit, but never Voodoo, the sensationalist and derogatory Western creation 
Bodhi is a comprehensive system of knowledge that has nothing to do with the simplistic and erroneous images of sticking pins into dolls, putting hexes on adversaries, or turning innocents into zombies. It is an organized form of communal support that provides meaning to the human experience in relation to the natural and supernatural forces of the universe. We can clearly see how Vidu has been ingrained to the point of irony. In Wikidata, however, although there is an, an entry for Vodou, the same concept is also known as Voodoo, which is seen as an alternative spelling. The image used to illustrate it is from an 1894 book of the world cultures called Ritpath's History of the World, and the image style uses the word Voodoo. The Ohio State University digitally published the book as a historical record, say, Ritpath avoids the extreme Eurocentrism of many contemporaries but nevertheless operates with explicit notions of racial hierarchy. He often refers to Africa as the dark continent and to Africans as savages, yet this is a, a source of the information for this record. In Wik Wikimedia Commons, the book is categorized as scientific racism, but as I say, it's still used as a source. Most scholars agree that voodoo should not be used and tell us the extent to which the word voodoo has been used as a tool to demonize and belittle. The museum documentation is silent on all of this. They clarify and resolve nothing. They reduce the object to a static thing with no history or no significance. They make no comment on the relevance of the object in the present. There is a lack of interest in providing context that this object necessitates for anyone coming across it online or indeed in the museum cabinet. Unlike ChatGVT, this record is hard to find in the catalogue. It can't be found by the words Gree Gree, and it can't be found through most of the context provided to ChatGPT. This record illustrates important omissions, and there's no real way of adding them because it's in a thick structure. Alfonso Constanzo was the leader of a drugs gang which committed brutal murders and eventually led to the death of an American citizen. He was associated with being an occultist. The book that you can see here written by a journalist, is cited by scholars as having no basis in evidence or reality. There is no evidence of any association with African religions or that Constanzo based his reign of terror and debt on it. But these associations are put forward under the headline of Voodoo. <laughs> this record documents many of the ma many paper mache figures used in the Day of the Dead celebrations. The Day of the Dead holiday both celebrates and honors friends and family who have died. It's part of the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage humanity. Yet the book is cited here, perhaps partly because of the equally erroneous links to the religion of Santa Marta. Um, Constanza had a statue of the saint, which itself has a different history to the day I dead, and is a growing religion, but it is not a deep devil worshiping cult, quite the opposite. This represents a particularly poor example of documentation and a lack of duty of care to provide accurate information, absence of discrimination. The author of the record has decided to put in the curatorial comments a reference to the book called A Nightmare Tale of Drugs, Voodoo, and Death in Mexico for a description of narco-Satanists. There is no context or explanation why the visitor might want to use this book and the purpose, but the association is made and it shouldn't be there. Alfonso Constanzo criminal cult is linked to Vidu and Santa Merte, representing a similar pattern of racist characterization. Both Vidu and Santa Merte have been misappropriated by, misappropriated by journalists, politicians, churches, and in this, in this case, a museum. In the television series Penny Dreadful, the researchers Kate Kingsbury and Andrew Chestnut point out the facts presented depict Santa Merte as a so-called chaos demon. Such attributions reek of cultural misappropriation, misunderstanding, and neocolonialism. Santa Merte is not in any way linked to the devil, and to assume so is to suffer a colonial hangover. When the Spanish colonialists game over, came upon the death deities of pre Hispanic Mexico, they misconstrued them not as gods and goddesses, but as satanic figures, forced indigenous people to abandon their worship at risk of torture seeking to obliterate all local origins, richest forms, and replace them with Catholicism. 
Lastly, when we consult vocabularies like Getty vocabulary, but it's in other vocabularies as well, we see that voodoo is the preferred term instead of the correct term, voodoo, showing the way in which the term has been gradually conflated. I have another example, um, but I'm going to cut that one out because at the time that we spent this morning with the, uh, the technical issues. Um, but it's about peace pipe. And it's basically the same pattern where peace pipe is taken up. There's no such thing as a peace pipe. Um, and uh, it's been taken by the media and other uh, uh, information sources to depict it as a uh, littlement uh, and misunderstanding of Native American culture. Well, go through these. You have. I'll I'll put these on online. You can look at them. All right, measure. And so I'm going on to change that. Yeah. So there are a number of reasons why I wanted to highlight these issues in the keynote. But first is there is a problem talking about these issues. I attended one online meeting which discussed the lack of transparency on the subject, turning the record button to off, conscious that talking about these issues might lead to problems with their employers. Many museums have initiated projects which address some of these issues, but very few of them have integrated them into the everyday processes of their organisation. On the one hand, it's a recognised problem, and on the other, public conversations are seen as problematic. The second reason is that for some time now, CDOC has been developing a documentation framework that is capable of at least helping to resolve the documentation issues that I've been highlighting, the CDOC CRM. But it'll take a lot more. It will need organization back, like organizational backing in organizations where senior man management are unaware of the possibilities. It will require the right systems in a sector dominated by traditional database collection systems. It will require a new way of thinking about documentation and a reversal of the decline in documentation questions. And it is likely to need a new approach to participation in the writing of documentation. There is a huge, large legacy that fixing the problem is likely to require participat participatory approach, which goes back to educating senior management. It also needs to highlight projects which are already making, uh, which are already which are already making changes in their approach to heritage documentation. And I wanted to discuss quickly there are two current initiatives. One is a collaborative research project and the other is an institutional system. The research project is SPAUS, a consortium with 14 European and North American art historical photo archives. It between them hold 28 million rec documentation records. There are or have been they are or have been funded by the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Crest Foundation. Bringing together legacy records is itself a painstaking task since all the organization organizations, despite fixed standards, use different data models, and over the years, data management rules have been broken. However, the first phase of data has been migrated to the CDOC CRM, where semantic precision is re-exerted, which necessarily resolves the data issues that exist in systems with no formal semantics. In other aggregation projects, the aim has been to create a common denominator model, a union catalogue, in which, as I've mentioned, homogenization leads to the loss of knowledge, and in some cases, it's distortion. It becomes a one-stop reference site or finding aid, and then itself becomes static. The approach of the project, the approach of the Eros project, recognizes that the whole exercise is pointless unless the resource becomes dynamic and the sources it was derived from are actively integrated into the knowledge graph. The second stage of Eros is to provide an interactive periphery environment in which the contributing organizations and others can start to expand the categories of information and add their ongoing work and thinking into the system. To survive, it needs to be continually changing and to do what internal documentation systems fail to do, respond to new scholarship and bring in wider variety of views. will allow structured arguments, allow the data to be arranged in different ways to support different viewpoints, support uncertainty, and be able to make use of a new CDOC CRM extension like no, on new CDOC CRM extensions like CRM influence that help represent transformation and change and which allow researchers to show multiple sources of influence or causation. 
The second example is particularly important because it's an example of the first fully linked data information system being used in a museum, in this case, in the collection care department of the National Archives, as a core institutional system, specifically to break down the divisions and remove fragmentation internally, to raise the quality of information being produced, recognizing the level of expertise and knowledge in the department, and then using that dynamic to establish partnerships, provide educational materials, and to generally engage with the public. The collection care department in the National Archives replaced their conservation database system with a CDOC CRM knowledge base as part of a long-standing strategy of using a practitioner researcher approach. The idea that everyday knowledge processes are in fact research and should be recorded at that level, coupled with the idea that using the paradigm, the information recorded at a higher level of detail could then be used for knowledge exchange. Moreover, specific research projects could use the system and this would be incorporated into the day-to-day. The National Archives in the UK contains a great deal of your papers, and conservation and science professionals also spend time understanding and documenting the historical and social nature of these papers, having a system that allows transdisciplinary patterns of semantics. Semantic information means that they can combine their technical information with historical information, building a far more representative picture of the work that they do. In addition to enhancing the level of information recorded about day-to-day activities, a broader knowledge base sits as another layer above connecting to the day-to-day knowledge. It records methods and techniques and also historical context, information that the department builds up either through its normal program of work or through additional funded research. In this way, they can show how the department and its approaches change over time. The knowledge base will change and therefore uh, day-to-day activities will reflect this change connecting to an updated part of the knowledge base. The system will provide a provenance of knowledge useful to new, existing, and future members of the department, but also, through planned access, provide a knowledge base for people outside the organization. Detailed conservation and scientific information can be stored and visualized, but at the same time, people can become the modelers of their own data and associate information to provide the context that makes the platform a valuable social resource not simply an administrative database. In effect, the National Archive treats all sources of knowledge as part of the same interconnected knowledge graph. This means that when they are funded externally, they can demonstrate that all the outputs of research are incorporated into their board processes. Even specific applications developed for particular purposes become part of the same system, whether internal or external. Practice is research, and all knowledge ultimately comes from doing. And this is an example of new documentation. Thank you very much.